Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we're delighted to have a wonderful speaker with us, Dr. David Scorton, um, who's president and CEO of the Association of American Medical Colleges. Um, someone else is going to do the, the more formal introduction for Dr. Scorton tonight, and that is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Travis from uh, the NB Anderson Cancer Center. Now, some of you have attended um, our series of talks that we jo do jointly with, with, with Dr. Travis, but um, for those who haven't um, met her before, let me tell you that Dr. Travis is the Associate Vice President um, of Faculty Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and she's also the Maddie Allen Fair Professor in Cancer Research in the Department of Experimental Radiation Oncology and Pulmonary Medicine at the, at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, Dr. Travis is a constant and passionate advocate for women and minority faculty at MD Anderson, but also in the community. And if you've ever seen her in action, she is um, so uh, supportive and knowledgeable and um, a constant worker in terms of uh, working in, in terms of uh, equity, both in the community at MD Anderson. She's the principal investigator on an NIH U54 grant with Puerto Rico, um, which is a, a training program aimed at increasing the number of Hispanic physicians and scientists in cancer research and medicine. Um, she's also a fellow of the American Society of Radiation Oncology and uh, the recipient of the Associative Association of American Medical Colleges Group on Women in Science in Medicine and uh, Leadership Development Award. There are many other honors and um, positions that I could tell you um, with the, about um, the work that, that Dr. Travis has done. Um, a lot of it related to what you're gonna hear about tonight, but I really do want to let you to get onto the speaker. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll hand things over to you, Dr. Travis. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Vivian, for that kind introduction of me. And so, and also I wanna thank the Baker Institute for partnering again with us uh, I always look forward to this, so I'm glad, even though we're not in person, and I sure wish David, uh, Dr. Scorton was here in person with us. But let me introduce you to, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. David Scorton. He is currently the president and CEO of the Association of American Medical Colleges, or we call it the WAMC. It's an odd profit association dedicated to transforming healthcare through medical education, patient care, research, and community uh, collaboration. Its members are all 155 accredited U.S. and 17 Canadian medical schools, more than 400 teaching hospitals and health systems, including Department of Veterans Affairs Medical Center, and more than 70 academic societies. It is indeed a big job. So Dr. Scorton has had an eclectic, distinguished career in a number of domains. He covers government, higher education, and medicine. He started his career as a physician He's a cardiologist, was on the faculty at the University of Iowa uh, where he, for 26 years, where he also served as vice president for research and external uh, relations. His spe he specialized in the treatment of adolescents and adults with congenital heart disease, and he pioneered, pioneered cardiac imaging and computer imaging process. He was also co-director and co-founder of the university's adolescent and adult congenital heart disease clinic. He then served as a president of that university, the first of two universities where he served as president. The second was Cornell University from 2006 to 2015. And at that time, he also held two academic appointments as when he was president. He, uh, he held an academic appointment as professor in inter internal medicine and pediatrics and biomedical, biomedical engineering at the College of Engineering. Always with an eye on the future to this day, he established a diversity council at Cornell in 2006. So before joining the WAMC, Dr. Scorton kind of, um, he has a number, number of interests uh, besides science and medicine, and one is the arts and humanities. And he married his interest in all of those fields when he served as the 13th secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, where he oversaw 19 museums, 21 libraries, the National Zoo, I could go on. His key accomplishments during his tenure were include the opening of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Relevant to Women's History Month, which we are almost at the end of, he diversified the Smithsonian's leadership with women and people of color, accounting for 69% of new hires at the director level or above during his tenure, including the first female director of the National Air and Space Museum 
and the first woman named director of the National uh, American um, National Museum of America. The, Sm Sm the Smithsonian's American Women's History Initiative was created also during his tenure, as well as plans for the first Latino gallery on the National Mall. He joined uh, the AAMC in 2019. Uh, I am still but about to roll off as a member of the board. So I've had a great, the great pleasure of working with David for a couple of years. He first led a comprehensive strategic planning process that established a new mission and a vision for AAMC and 10 bold action plans to tackle the nation's most intractable challenges in health and healthcare and make academic medicine more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. Then COVID happened. A year into his tenure, COVID happened, and he shared his expertise in medical education, patient care, research, and health inequities and disparities. He's contributed to the national pandemic response through frequent interactions with senior government officials, appearances in national media, articles and opinion pieces in the press, and now a new pod podcast called Beyond the White Coat. When, we, when the national protests erupted over police brutality, Dr. Scorton was a passionate and outspoken voice for ending systemic racism in academic medicine and addressing persistent health disparities. Throughout his career, he has focused on the issues of diversity and inclusion. He's a nationally recognized supporter of the arts and humanities, as well as an accomplished jazz musician and composer. Uh, he's the, he is the uh, iconic uh, Renaissance man for sure. He believes that many of society's thorniest problems can only be solved by combining the sciences, social sciences, and arts and humanity. He's published major, two major texts, hundreds of research articles, opinion pieces, and book chapters on topics ranging from his med medical specialty, cardiac imaging, uh, to higher education, and other broad issues of national concern. He's a member of the National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosoph uh, Philosophical Society. Those, you have to be elected to those organizations. Um, he received his bachelor's degree in psychology from Northwestern and his medical degree from Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. And he completed both his residency and fellowship training at UCLA. As I said, as a member of the board of directors, I've had the privilege and pleasure of working with David for the past two years. I can tell you he is a courageous and visionary leader with great wit and empathy. His leadership has infused the WAMC and, and our constituents with exciting new ideas that have been fully embraced and already being executed. I look forward to following David's impact on the medical and scientific community, as well as on health, healthcare in general. It will be, I promise you, an exciting show. His title tonight is to create better health for all, we must involve all sectors and address fundamental issues. Dr. Scorton, thank you for being here and we look forward to your address. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ho and Dr. Travis. It's just a, a wonderful thing to be here and uh, virtually be, be back at the Texas Medical Center where I visited and had uh, many, many wonderful visits. I'm very honored to be here and I thank you for this opportunity and uh, Dr. Travis for your very kind, overly kind introduction. Well, uh, to put it mildly, this has been a very, very challenging time uh, for our nation in, in so many ways. The pandemic, a reckoning related to racism and continuing shocking and yet somehow predictable episodes of violence and hate. These very difficult and persistent problems will benefit, I believe, from the sort of expertise you have at the Baker Institute. And I'm honored to be with you today to talk about another set of challenges related to our individual and national health. I wanna start by congratulating uh, Rice University's Nia Lane and my friend and colleague, Norm Augustine, who last fall worked closely to produce an update to their 2014 American Academy of Arts and Sciences report, this time issuing an urgent call to action by titling their report, The Perils of Complacency, America at a Tipping Point in Science and Technology. This kind of work that you do is so important and this kind of work that you do at Baker is so needed. Although we've seen recent investments continue in important institutions like the National Institutes of Health, the United States still needs a much more aggressive national strategy to invest in research and development. As, the, as your report notes, 
America's total national investment in research and development as a fraction of GDP has remained stagnant at 2.4 to 2.7% for half a century. Well, that status quo, in my view, is not acceptable. I believe that now is the time to invest in our research infrastructure, and this really needs to be the finest hour for research if we commit to making R&D a national priority. Uh, Norman and Neil's paper and all the important and meaningful work happening here at the Baker Institute are really terrific examples of the value of academic institutions working in concrete ways to advance policy in a data-driven and evidence-based manner. I'm glad to be here with you today to talk about how we in academia can help create a healthier world for people everywhere through our work and through advocating for public policies that impact health. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic, as you very well know, has revealed in stark relief the fault lines in our health system, particularly how we have failed our most marginalized communities. Too many people living in America are not as healthy as they could be because the system just isn't working for them. If you're of Latinx heritage, you're more likely than if you are white to be hospitalized or die from COVID. And last fall, Houston's health department data showed that Hispanics accounted for 54% of this city's COVID-related deaths, even though the population accounts for under half of the city's population. And increased COVID risks are also true across the country if you're Black, if you identify as American Indian, as an Alaska Native, if you identify as LGBTQ, you're also at heightened risk. But it's not just COVID-19. Diseases like asthma, diabetes, and hypertension, as well as conditions like obesity, are more likely to affect Black adults, for example, than white adults. But these are long-standing health inequities exacerbated now by the pandemic. We have been failing these communities for generations for reasons that go well beyond what happens in a patient's examination room. As you all know so well, so much of a person and a community's health is unrelated to genetics or even medical care, but rather a product of what we call social determinants of health, of which I know you're well aware. These include where and how the person lives, as well as whether or not they have affordable and convenient access to healthcare services. The reality, patients in poorer neighborhoods often receive lower quality care and less care. Here in Houston, as you know, the poverty rate is nearly double the national rate at 20.8%. One reason may be that Texas has the nation's highest percentage of people who are uninsured, which has ripple effects across the state's economy. According to a Houston Health Department report, your zip code is more important than your genetic code in determining how long you will live. Life expectancy in richer Houston neighborhoods is as much as 18 years longer compared to those in poorer neighborhoods. In fact, science tells us that factors like housing density, green space, access to public transportation significantly affect a person's health. And this, of course, is true across the country, not just in Houston. Many people do not have adequate access to housing, education, economic stability, and other resources that promote health. And so we shouldn't be surprised that their health suffers as a result. Disparities in access to insurance are a continuing reality. Across Harris County, 87.6% of whites have health insurance compared with 54.3% of Hispanic or Latino adults. And there is now evidence that factors like access to insurance and stable housing have a real measurable impact on patients' health. Recent research co-authored by my AAMC colleague, Dr. Philip Alberti, shows that there's actually a high correlation between what are called health-related social needs, including employment, family, housing, psychosocial factors, and socioeconomic status, and rates of patients' readmission to the hospital after discharge. An example, crowded living conditions and poor access to food, water, and health insurance in Native American communities have contributed to devastating COVID-19 outbreaks on reservations. Native Americans are 19 times more likely than white people to lack indoor plumbing, which of course makes things like hand washing difficult. So we shouldn't be surprised that new research just revealed 
that Native Americans are dying from COVID at twice the rate of white Americans. We should have seen this coming. It's not new and it's not just Native Americans and it's not just any one demographic group alone. It is sobering for me to realize the breadth and tenacity of the problem and my own personal role in its persistence. I feel and have felt for some years uncomfortable with the fact that I and others in positions to make a difference have repeatedly failed to make more progress. And I personally wish I had done even more throughout my 40 years in healthcare education and government to address some of the roots of the problem. This isn't just about rampant health inequities. The underlying cause of these inequities is an uncomfortable truth we have failed to address completely. Systemic racism and poverty have repeatedly and unrelentingly created significant obstacles in health, in part through the social determinants of health for far too many people. The fundamental problem isn't just that patients or communities don't have, for example, affordable housing, or for that matter, running water, it's that racism via lending and urban planning practices and employment practices, among other examples, has put up a barrier of prohibiting access to that housing and to that running water. And poverty too, of course, creates enormous barriers. We need to do better to address those root fundamental underlying causes, which often have to do more broadly with the lack of access to information, social capital and money. And that is where we need to dedicate our efforts as policy advocates to addressing those broader needs. To be sure, overt discriminatory practices from the 1960s and earlier have since been outlawed in this country, but their impact still remains and discrimination continues in different forms. Here's one compelling example. The outlawed practice of redlining in the mortgage industry. In 2018, an investigation by the Center for Responsible Lending found that in 61 metro areas across the country, African-American and Latino home buyers are still routinely denied conventional mortgage loans at rates far higher than buyers who are white. The study found, for example, that whites in Philadelphia receive 10 times as many conventional mortgage loans as African-Americans do, despite there being roughly equal numbers of each throughout the city's population. And this is not just an anomaly. It is based on a comprehensive year-long study that evaluated 31 million records across the country using techniques that are endorsed by leading academics. We also can't avoid the long-term effects of historical discrimination. Even today, the real estate app Redfin tells us that, quote, black homeowners are nearly five times more likely to own in a formerly red line neighborhood than in a green line neighborhood, resulting, resulting in diminished home equity and overall economic inequality for black families, end of quote. That may contribute to a major wealth gap that is echoed across the economy in other ways too. According to the Economic Policy Institute, at every level of education, the black unemployment rate is significantly higher than the white unemployment rate even for workers with advanced degrees and college degrees. And likewise, the Economic Policy Institute tells us that black men are paid 71 cents on the white male dollar. Black women who, who face both gender and race discrimination are paid even less, 64 cents on the white male dollar. That employment and economic disparity contributes to health disparities because access to the factors that support health can be out of reach for people with lower incomes. Here's an example. Large supermarket chains sometimes deem low-income neighborhoods as unprofitable. So if you identify as African-American, especially if you live in a lower income area, you're half as likely than if you are white to have access to chain supermarkets, which are tremendous sources of whole, healthy, and less processed food options. And that in turn, breeds resulting health problems that we know all about, like obesity, type two diabetes and heart disease. Even when people make a conscious effort to bring health stores into low income neighborhoods, it doesn't always work. Many people with lower incomes cannot afford to buy foods from the new stores that are marketed as healthy. And in many cases, they're forced anyway to move away, moving into areas with even less access to healthy foods. Likewise, an ABC News story earlier this month 
reported on what they call the drugstore disparity in majority non-white rural neighborhoods, which have an average of one pharmacy for close to 10,000 people, significantly less than in whiter rural neighborhoods. And we see disparities also in the white population. In a recent book entitled Deaths of Despair and the Future of Capitalism, released about a year ago, economist Ann Case and Nobel Prize winning economist Angus Deaton outlined the rise in deaths from suicide, drug overdose, and alcoholism among middle-aged white people without a college degree, who often, of course, are the victims of job loss in rural parts of the country that were dependent, for example, on manufacturing. We must work to change this. The call for social justice that we saw so vividly in 2020 is a reminder that systemic racism has plagued our health system too, just as it has affected so many other sectors of American life. The fundamental causes that underlie whether or not a person's social determinants of health are favorable are the same fundamental causes that affect the social determinants of education and the social determinants of employment. In the realm of health for too long, the medical community has decided what the health goals should be for our patients, their families and communities. We've set the standards influenced by our own implicit biases, our definitions and our training. The lived experiences of our patients who have been marginalized and harmed and in our healthcare system are not in my view emphasized enough. We cannot rationalize the situation by imagining that this is a new problem. Let's look at heart disease. Until 1970, believe it or not, there were no significant racial inequities in heart disease mortality. Then bypass surgery and later statins were introduced widely. And even though mortality rates declined for both blacks and whites, a brand new inequity emerged because access to novel therapies is not equal. So ultimately, significantly more black people than white people die from heart disease today. As the researchers Phelan and Link put it in their landmark 2005 study published in the journals of gerontology, when we develop the ability to control disease and death, the benefits of this newfound ability are distributed according to resources of knowledge, money, power, prestige, and beneficial social connections. Those who are advantaged with respect to such resources benefit more from new health enhancing capabilities and consequently experience lower mortality rates. Disparities are the result, end of quote. For another example, a 2018 study out of Duke University Medical Center found that only one third of black patients had been prescribed a statin dose high enough to meet treatment guidelines compared to 44% of whites. The researchers noted many factors, including that Blacks were less likely to be treated by a cardiologist familiar with current treatment guidelines. Well, this is parallel to what we're seeing now with vaccines. CDC data from just a few weeks ago in mid-February tells us that nearly two-thirds of people who have received two doses of a COVID vaccine are white, and white people have greater ability to seek and obtain a vaccine simply because of things like the more limited access to vaccines in black neighborhoods, as well, of course, as the digital divide, given often that people are registering for vaccines online. My generation has failed to make progress in addressing disparities over decades. Here's another example. In 1980, when I began my first faculty appointment, black men made up 3.4% of entering US medical students, 3.4% of matriculants. Today, black males make up 3.6%, even though blacks make up about 13% of the overall US population. We haven't moved the numbers meaningfully in 40 years. We must do better. We need to start by dismantling systemic racism and poverty at their roots if we hope to make meaningful progress and achieve the AAMC's mission to improve the health of people everywhere. Well, what's next is it's time to bring all experts to the table. That's a change from how society has been operating and it's gonna take some rethinking. The primary way we as a society have tackled these problems has historically been a somewhat piecemeal approach. Decisions about access to healthcare have been made separately from decisions about other societal issues, including how we handle gun violence, substance use, 
poverty, and homelessness. It's time we finally recognize the complexity and the interrelatedness of all these issues and many more. And we must get creative in solving these problems, especially because access to care is a critical component. If people can't afford to pay for health insurance, how can we help them by expanding insurance options? If taking time off work to travel to an appointment with a specialist located a good distance away is difficult for some patients and their families, can we expand our existing telehealth infrastructure to make accessing quality care more straightforward? And what other solutions of these types can be explored? To brainstorm effectively, I believe we must bring together all sectors business, government, academia, public health, community organizations, and more to collaborate and address the root causes of the problem, addressing and eliminating the systemic racism and poverty that stands as an impenetrable barrier to access. As part of this process, we must listen to and involve those who are most effective by a variety of policies, even ones we don't necessarily immediately think of as being related to health like immigration policy, which among other factors affects the diversity of our future healthcare workforce. Only by finally bringing everyone to the table can we develop healthcare policies that truly reflect the complexity and lived experiences of the people and communities they affect. We need everyone's wisdom to help fix what is broken. Consider the words of another colleague at the AAMC, Dr. Malika Fair, who is Senior Director of Health Equity Partnerships and Programs, and also serves as an Associate Clinical Professor and Practicing Physician in the Department of Emergency Medicine of the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Last May, Dr. Fair wrote that, championing equity in academic medicine is not an individual sport and will not be accomplished solely by good intentions. Going forward, each of us needs to be personally aware institutionally committed and community partnered to create systems to detect and rectify unjust inequities for all populations." End of her quote. You know that the type of community collaboration she is envisioning really does work and is feasible. And because we know this, the AAMC is embracing, as Dr. Travis mentioned, community collaborations in a more deliberate way, as I'll share in a moment. But first, let's look at a few examples. Here's a Houston example. At the Texas Medical Center, the Manager Clinic launched a Manager Moms program, as you, I'm sure you know about, a virtual program designed by moms for moms to help new moms support each other during the pandemic when resources like daycares are not available. It focuses on mental and physical wellness and provides supportive solutions designed to help moms cope and develop a long-term healthy self-care regimen. Moms lead each other through a program sharing their own lived experiences and have access to therapeutic services provided by clinic professionals. The program, as I understand it, is available to all in Texas. Another noteworthy example. In Chicago, Rush University took action at the very outset of the COVID pandemic by creating a program called Chicago Homelessness and Health Response Group and Equity, sometimes referred to as CHARGE as an extension of one of the 35 ongoing programs of the 30-year-old Rush Community Service Initiatives Program. Working closely with the city's public health officials and other health systems, CHARGE administers COVID tests, addresses outbreaks, provides behavioral health services, and identifies gaps in care coordination while laying out a plan for permanent housing for the homeless population. CHARGE is now developing an actual playbook for scaling up the program beyond the pandemic to engage health providers across the city and surrounding suburbs. The work rush has spearheaded has become a movement in Chicago that will continue to systematically address health disparities even after this pandemic has ended. In addition, Rush University Medical Center has partnered with a group of healthcare institutions, residents, educators, nonprofits, businesses, government agencies and faith-based institutions to launch a community collaborative with support from the Oprah Winfrey Charitable Foundation. This program distributes wellness kits, PPE and meals to at-risk older adults while also engaging them directly through community health workers and contact tracers. I think this is a great example of community collaboration. 
to do all of this right, we must be inclusive, we must be intentional, and we must be accountable. I'm the first to admit that academic medicine generally and the AAMC specifically could be doing more to bridge the gap between medical care and public health. But we're changing that now and holding ourselves accountable through a new strategic plan and a broader mission for academic medicine. As you know, our traditional tripartite mission, excuse me, medical education, clinical care and research is no longer enough. At the AAMC, we're calling for adding a fourth leg of the stool, community collaborations. Today, collaborating with diverse communities deserves, in my mind, equal weight with academic medicine's traditional missions. This, mean, this means going beyond delivering care to establish ongoing two-way community dialogues. It means appreciating community assets and listening to the needs, listening to the lived experiences and listening to the perspectives of patients, families and communities in an ongoing way. As part of the AAMC's new strategic plan, we are prioritizing the community collaboration aspect of academic medicine's mission. And we're doing that through an action plan specifically designed to launch the AAMC as a national leader in health equity and health justice, which includes the formation of a new entity in the works, the AAMC Center for Health Justice, which will be launching later this year to prioritize initiatives that advance the moral, financial, and societal imperative of health justice. That's being run by that gentleman, Dr. Philip Alberti, whom I mentioned before. Also, we have formed the AAMC Research and Action Institute, a modest think tank of our own following, if you will, in the footsteps of the Baker Institute, as we believe strongly in the importance of organizations like Baker and so many others across the country, that there's real value in bringing together perspectives across many backgrounds and areas of expertise. The AAMC Research and Action Institute convenes national experts to examine some of the most critical issues affecting the missions and institutes of academic medicine. For example, they've released guidance on face coverings and other areas during COVID. As we work together, please let's also be intentional in advocating for policies that can help dismantle the components of systemic racism. Let's look for opportunities to improve the underlying fundamental problems that in turn affect the social determinants of health. For example, investing in the public health infrastructure that serves all and considering urban planning, climate change, and many other factors not always felt to be in the purview of health, as well, of course, as broader insurance coverage and access. To achieve this, we must be smart about how we use the insights we gather from the diverse set of perspectives that we invite to the discussion. We must be inclusive and keep our minds open to new approaches and learning lessons from other communities in which community input help effectively move the needle in informing smarter policies that make an impact. In the example of the Rush University charge example I referenced earlier, the university itself has made changes to its own capabilities to have long-term impacts on the community in broader ways, including through hiring, purchasing, and investment strategies that leverage community partnerships to support job applicants during the hiring process. That to me is the kind of real lasting change we should all be looking to make. We must be intentionally selective, prioritizing those issues where we can make the biggest impact. And we must be accountable using an inclusive approach to measurement that blends community voices with research data. One example of how this kind of blended measurement approach can work is right here in Houston, or I should say right there in Houston. You may recall that about a decade ago, the city of Houston's health department had received complaints from community members about air pollution coming from metal recycling facilities in the area. People were concerned that emissions from the facilities were causing health risks to residents nearby, even though the health department determined that the recycling facilities were in fact adhering to all legal limits and requirements. The health department, as you may know, reached out to the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston to problem solve solutions for the community together. And in that process, they formed a collaborative group that combined academic research from the university with input from a community advisory board and door to door surveys of residents. I think that's a great example of combining academic chops with the lived experiences of the community. 
The health department also brought in a broad group of additional voices, including an air quality advocacy group, advocacy group and managers of the recycling facility itself. This allowed the health department to establish a safe, open and trusted relationship across people with different interests. Let's do this more whenever we find opportunities to do so. Finally, I wanna say no matter your individual role, please think about how you can collaborate even more with those outside your traditional walls, especially to bridge the gap between academic medical centers and broad public health organizations to ultimately dismantle systemic racism at its roots. Seek out diverse voices and listen with an open mind and think about how to translate those insights into concrete measurable actions. Consider how you and your organization can positively impact the social determinants of health, address the fundamental causes that underlie the challenges marginalized populations face, and ensure that every voice matters. I know that researchers at the Baker Institute have joined forces with the MD Anderson Cancer Center to explore variations in the quality of cancer treatment provided to elderly patients throughout the state. What further programming could we all consider that involves similar types of excellent collaboration? The Baker Institute has some tremendous resources available here at the Texas Medical Center. Let's all think about ways to build on your example and those connections to make a broader impact, not just in Texas, but around the nation. Now really is our time to act. Thank you so much for having me and for listening. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Scorton. There were so many important issues that you covered and so clearly, I think there's a lot of interesting things we can discuss. Now, um, for the participants, uh, if you have questions, please go ahead and uh, enter them in the Q&A box. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to take advantage of having such an expert um, guest to, to ask you some questions that I, I don't usually get to ask, um, you know, other people who can answer them. You know, I was attending a recent meeting where I found out that insurance companies are starting to code socioeconomic determinants of health in their um, in their in their claims, you know, in, in their visits. And, and to me as a researcher, I was very excited about this because I can start looking at patient outcomes and also match them up with um, any types of resources that patients are lacking. But then I discovered during this conversation that there are people who are quite uncomfortable with this approach. Um, you know, having physicians ask these, some physicians don't wanna ask these questions, some are worried that they're stigmatizing the patient. Could you talk of, about this, this, this challenge of, and, and I'd love your opinion on it. Well, uh, you've stated it just perfectly, Dr. Ho. Uh, at, at first blush, it looks like you know, more data is helpful, but then you have to figure out um, the comfort of the people gathering the data and what the data may be used for. And so I have to admit that I followed the exact path that you followed in your own thinking at first, I wondered whether this was possibly promising practice. Now I'm not so sure. I want to be quick to mention, however, that I'm not an expert in the details of how the data are being gathered, and I'm trying to learn more about it at the current time. So I'm just basically where, where you are in the process. And the issue of stigmatizing patients is tremendously important. And perhaps one approach to that would be to have uh, uh, the question asked in a blended way by not only community leaders, but those who are uh, executives at uh, patient advocacy organizations. For example, as Dr. Travis knows, we always have a public member on the AAMC board. Right now, we have a Beverly Johnson on the board who heads up a, a, an organization that advocates for patients, families, and communities. So to recognize that there are people like that means that all the decisions do not have to be made and probably shouldn't be made just within the system itself. So I wish I could give you more, more data, but I'm, I'm also on a learning curve as you are. And thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, it's, it's a very new process. I mean, this is just starting. So um, it'll be interesting to see how it develops. A question from Izzy Carroll. What kind of changes to medical education need to happen to create advocacy oriented and policy knowledgeable physicians? Um, well, thanks, um, Izzy, if it's okay for me to use the first name. Um, I, I think that um, uh, the, the beauty of the American um, academic system in general is that it's not a system. 
is that there's a lot of ingenuity and uh, new, new things happening all over the country at individual institutions, like the examples that I was able to dig up quickly about what you're doing here um, at Texas Medical Center. And so um, I think those, those answers are best decided locally. But since you were nice enough to ask, I'll, I'll tell you what I think. And this is not a, um, this is not a double AMC policy. This is just my, my point of view. Um, again, uh, uh, yielding to uh, local decisions by faculty members. Um, I would say that um, introducing the social determinants of health and going a step earlier to these underlying fundamental causes that themselves lead to social determinants of health, I think it would be great for that to be included in curricula, and it is happening in a lot of places around the country. And so I think that's, that's one. Now, you're asking a harder question, Izzy. You're asking about advocacy-oriented and policy-knowledgeable physicians. And this is going to take a, a reach that we may not even have expertise in some of our medical schools on the usual faculty. But we do have expertise in those who represent the medical schools in, um, in advocacy and those who are public policy experts in the parent university. And so one, uh, one thing that I would suggest is that the medical school faculty and being a, a lifelong faculty member or an adult, my adult life anyway, faculty member, I think it's important that the uh, curricula are in the hands of the faculty and not dictated uh, from on high. I always tried to uh, you know, stick with that when I was a college president. And if I forgot, the faculty center always reminded me. But, um, but, but in that regard, I think it would be great at the faculty level for faculty to seek out peers in those departments and areas of the university or even local universities or even other universities that are not local to find out what sort of a curricular change might occur to, to do that. Now, let's say we get people through the undergraduate medical education and graduate medical education, and they've had some exposure to some of these underlying issues. Then I think a fair extension of your important question, Izzy, is when you are a faculty a physician, for example, or healthcare professional in some other a branch of, of the work that we do, how do you get active in advocacy and policy, given that uh, we tend to think about that as a, as, a, as a team sport, where we're thinking about the uh, overall good of the institution, and I'm always urging um, individual faculty members. Just a couple of days ago, I had a meeting with our Council on Faculty and Academic Societies at the AAMC, which represents 70 academic societies, to urge them to become active as a, as a public voice and to become active as a public voice, whether it's a, an op-ed or an appearance on a radio station or writing a blog or whatever it is, you have to educate yourself about the issues that you're advocating for. So those are the approaches that I would take at the undergraduate level, the faculty uh, conferring with others and other departments that are relevant. Um, and then as we go on farther, those other ways of approaching it. I do wanna leave this long-winded answer to a very direct question where I started it, that I think the answer to that needs to be local at the institution, depending on the proclivities of the faculty and depending on what resources they have at their disposal. So I hope that went a little bit toward answering it. And thank you for the question. You know, to follow up on that question, I, I'm just curious. Um, what would you like to train your young doctors? It, how how would you like to give them information on how to respond when they encounter a patient they're looking at and they realize this patient does not have the resources to pay for the drugs or other treatments that I want this patient to receive? Well, there's already a movement within medical curricula in many medical schools to make sure that uh, uh, caregivers uh, understand the vagaries of our, um, of our healthcare financing system, which uh, I, I don't know, Dr. Ho, if you would agree, but uh, if you tried to make it more complicated, I don't think you possibly could. I mean, it's un unbelievably complicated. It's Byzantine. And so I think that we're already seeing quite a bit of emphasis on that. But then there's a lot of other things that that patient encounter. And, you know, we've already changed over the last uh, couple of decades so that we're more aware of looking for evidence of abuse when we see a patient, for looking for evidence of other psychosocial issues that may affect health. We also need to get better about understanding 
the um, uh, the living environment in which they are, but understanding that that power divide between a physician or even a medical student and a patient from a marginalized group is a vast gaping chasm. And so I think, again, uh, I don't mean to make this like the, the be all and end all, but I think asking our patients, asking community voices, what is the way to find that information out is better than assuming we know the way to tease information out, out of uh, people in terms of their lived experiences. And this is a new road that we're treading, uh, Dr. Ho, a new road of community collaborations. We just created this idea of the fourth leg of the stool just a few months ago. And this um, Center for Health Justice is not even fully established yet. It won't be launched until the late summer or fall. So I would very much love, as we talked about before the presentation started, I'd very much love, it'd be an honor to keep in touch with you as the Center for Health Justice launches and the think tank launches, because you guys are light years ahead of us, um, you know, many, many years ahead of us. And, um, and yet I think that Dr. Alberti and the people who are starting up the Center for Health Justice have some very interesting ideas taken from a population health or public health point of view. And one of the areas that I think, um, and I'm digressing a bit, so forgive me, one area that I think uh, can be helped by um, entities like the Baker Institute, which you already do, is bringing together healthcare expertise with public health and population health expertise, because medical care and public health communities have not always, to put it mildly, interacted as, as completely and as robustly as, as we might. And part of that will be our willingness in healthcare and medical care to listen to those in population health and public health. And part will also be for us in medical care, not only to advocate for our own funding, but to advocate for funding for the public health and population health professions. And we're doing that very, very actively at the AAMC right now. That is advocating for everything from funding for the CDC to the all important local and state health departments. Yeah, well, we're looking forward to working with you. We're very excited about, about this new initiative. Um, so we've got a question from Cameroonie, which is a, a, diff, a little bit hard to, um, to, to understand, but I'm going to elaborate because I was also interested in it. It's asking about the community collaboratives. And um, I'm, I'm wondering, is, is this something do you think that should be implemented as a requirement for all medical students? And also, where should the funding come from? You know, um, I, I never uh, lightly talk about things that are imperatives or musts. Uh, it gets into a lot of complicated issues about accreditation. We are co-sponsor with the AMA of the uh, Liaison Committee on Medical Education, the accrediting body recognized by um, the Department of Education, but we don't do the accreditation. And I think that um, the decision on uh, what happens is a, is a, a complicated dance between crediting institutions, crediting organizations, and faculty wisdom at the uh, and, and wisdom of leadership at, at an institution. So um, I would I would go short. I'd be cautious and go short of saying what I think needs to be sort of mandatory. But since you're nice enough to invite me to Houston virtually tonight, and you're paying all my expenses, I do, uh, which means I just turn the TV, the uh, computer on. Um, I, I do want to say that um, I think it would be great if uh, all the medical schools and teaching hospitals considered adding community collaborations to the tripartite mission. So we don't think twice about med ed, uh, research, and patient care. We, we salute those three uh, goals as critical uh, and unremittingly uh, to our overall functioning. It would be great if we got to the point where we believed enough in the wisdom of the communities that we felt that it was impossible to do an optimal job without having blended research from community voices plus the voices of those with professional research credentials. And so I'm a big enthusiast for this. I'm gonna push it as hard as I can. But again, uh, I don't mean to seem wishy-washy about this, but I'm a big believer in local prerogatives about what should happen in curricula. But if I could wave a magic wand, it would be part of what people would think about everywhere, not only in the undergraduate medical curricula, 
but in the operation of the teaching hospitals themselves. Thank you. Okay, so um, so Cameroni did um, elaborate on their question, um, and it's a challenging question. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you've thought about this, but you know, not only do we have the people in our country now, but right now we're we're dealing with a with a migration issue at the border. And um, I don't know if AAMC has thought about this particular issue and how it fits into, into this, um, this initiative. Well, um, we don't have a position on, uh, on what's happening at the southern border right now. We do believe that um, immigration is a very important issue for the country to reconsider. And I've written and spoken on this uh, uh, in a variety of ways, including uh, we've also filed amicus briefs from the AAMC regarding uh, DACA, for example. And we've done it um, through the lens of um, health care. So um, this is not answering uh, the question directly, but I'll get back to it in a moment. Um, in, in terms of the uh, DACA program, um, had that been rescinded, um, something like 30,000 healthcare workers in the United States would have lost their work authorization in one day by the stroke of a pen if the DACA program had been rescinded. So that's just one tiny example of how immigration is an issue that we have to pay attention to. I think that the question of how to deal with the problems at our southern border, which clearly in my view as a non-specialist, but someone who tries to keep up with the news, to me clearly reflect problems in the home countries and uh, problems that are forcing people to seek a different life. I have to admit as a personal comment only and not as a double AMC comment, I wanna to try to make that very clear that I'm a second generation American. One side of the family, my dad was from Russia, the other side of the family from uh, uh, another area in the Pale of Settlement. And um, they came here for a chance of a better life. They came here to some extent to avoid persecution. And I think that those two things are what's motivating a lot of the people who are coming to the southern border. So I think we need to have a compassionate point of view. We need to think about what's best for the overall good of those people. And that may involve very complex, very tough decisions. But no, we don't have a specific AAMC action right now related specifically to the southern border. I Thank appreciate you. the question. Thank you. Um, could you talk about um, what things could be done to increase recruitment uh, of people of color to be medical students? Well, um, I, I wish I had a quick answer to that one, Dr. Ho. As I mentioned before, I take personal responsibility for not doing enough. Over the many years, I had positions of high responsibility, tried a lot of different things, um, but uh, we are devoting uh, 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 two different action plans and one in specific and our goal is, the stated goal is to increase not only the applicants, but the number of matriculants from underrepresented groups. And rather than uh, second guess what they're doing, within a very short period of time, just a few months, we will have a specific set of, um, of initiatives within that action plan that we can be very glad to share back um, through Dr. Travis, if it's still while well, um, she and I are working together on the board or, or, or even after that point. But um, I will say just a, just a few things about that. Um, pipeline programs, in my view, that start in college are necessary but not sufficient. So I believe, for example, that if someone from a group vastly underrepresented in medicine uh, does not see herself or himself in that profession, even imagine it, even dream about it much earlier in life, a lot, a lot is lost long before that pipeline gets to college. And I'll tell you my own experience, uh, I, I'm not from an underrepresented group, except that I'm a first generation college student. And um, when I was applying for the, the first year the American Medical College Application Service was created at the AAMC 50 years ago was the year I applied to med school, which shows you how ancient I am. But um, I was not able to turn uh, to anyone in my family for advice about even applying to college, let alone to medical school. So multiply that many fold by a group that's underrepresented in a hundred other ways. And then you find out the, um, the, the work that we have to do, in my view, much earlier in a person's life. 
And that could involve, uh, for example, pipeline programs that start and have been started in some parts of the country as early as middle school. And increasing the idea that we want to help people from groups that are underrepresented in science, even let alone medicine, see themselves in that profession by being exposed to it when they may not be exposed to it um, in, in their own families as I was not. And so I think that that's one thing that I know the group at the AAMC is considering, but also that are continue, they're going to continue to do the very important pipeline programs that, that are at the more advanced uh, part of uh, undergraduate uh, college education as well. And then of course, there are um, issues related to standardized testing at both the undergraduate level and medical school admission level. And our medical college admission test uh, team is working very, very carefully and looking hard at um, the role of standardized testing and thinking carefully about how um, optimal use uh, of that test can actually help us to bring more underrepresented groups into medicine and certainly not keep people out of medicine based on a standardized test. So we're trying to take a, a, a fresh look at all of these different things and a look that is that has our eyes wide open. Uh, and, um, and so uh, again, we'll have to keep in touch with what they actually come up with. Um, none of our 10 action plans is as yet fully functional, but I did wanna share uh, with you and uh, very glad, it'd be an honor, Dr. Ho, to keep in touch with you. And as time goes on, we can share emails and as time goes on, uh, as these things turn into more concrete actions, you can see and I can give a better answer to some of these questions. Yeah, thank you. And and I'll also say that Dr. Travis um, messaged me privately. And, and of course, I should have thought of this because of her role and the work she's done that, that they've got other programs at MD Anderson that are working on this particular topic as well, as well as advancement of minorities in faculty positions and grant writing and, and these other things. So we'll have to, um, to catch up on that. Um, so, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Travis to close things out. Thank you, Dr. Ho, and thank you, Dr. Scorton. Uh, this was uh, beyond expectations as usual. I think you brought up uh, some really important issues that we all have to think about how to address them. And I think it's really important to get them out there and talk about them, which is very difficult sometimes for people to do. So thank you for doing that because that's part, that takes courage and uh, we really appreciate that. And so again, we are so sorry you're not here in person so we can't have dinner with you tonight. Uh, <laughs> and enjoy your company and continue these conversations. But we will, uh, as you said, continue them because I think you're gonna have a relationship probably with Dr. Ho at Rice and uh, I'm right across the street. So I look forward to that. So again, thank you. This has been a great, great honor. Thank you so much for letting me do this. Uh, I've already made some new friends. Thank you for those who raised the questions for asking tough and incisive questions. And um, please let's all keep in touch. This is great. The last thing I want to do is congratulate you for the wonderful, wonderful work that you're doing and uh, both institutions. And um, let's stay in touch. Thank you very, very much. And please, everybody, be careful out there. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.